Okay, so it's recording now. And we should be getting some people come online. So we'll just wait for all of those people to come online. Okay. Okay, so we're getting some participants that are coming on. They are arriving. Mm -hmm. Okay, just saying hello to everyone that has just joined so far. Um, we're just gonna wait a couple more minutes so that people can come online and so then we will make a start. <sighs> How's everybody doing? If you are coming online right now, just tell us, let us know in the chat whereabouts you're coming from, where in the world, because as we know for a small world, um, we are from all over the world. So we'd love to hear from where you are at. So let us know in the chat where you are coming from. We wanna know. I'm here, I'm coming from England right now. <laughs> and Yolanda, where are you coming from? London. 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 Same thing. <laughs> oh, we've got some. We've got Amsterdam, Dubai, Netherlands, New York. Wow. This is amazing. We've got so many. Oh, wow. Hi, everybody. Hi. <laughs> we've got Spain, Zurich. Wow, Germany. This is seriously global. This is everyone from everywhere. Amazing. Okay, so I think we'll just start getting started now. We've got quite a few people online so far. So welcome everybody, welcome to the um, Breathing Webinar. My name is Rebecca and I am uh, from the events team on A Small World. Um, and tonight we are talking a lot about breathing and we have invited our uh, lovely speaker, Yolanda, who is a author, filmmaker, and um, mental health advocate as well. So she's come to join us today and she's gonna be talking everything about her book, her new book that she came out last year in September um, called The Breathing Revolution. So Yolanda, do you want to just sort of do a little introduction about yourself, um, just to let us know uh, a little bit more about you and where you know, your sort of uh, background and everything? Sure, yeah, thanks so much for having me, by the way. It's really nice to be here. Um, yeah, hi everyone. I am... Yolanda. Um, I'm originally a filmmaker, um, a documentary filmmaker, and then kind of along the way I started on a spiritual journey slash mental health journey. And um, part of that journey uh, became yoga. Yoga became a really important part of my mental health recovery. I suffered uh, quite severely with anxiety and depression. Um, and you know, as a result of having those conditions, I, I struggled a bit with addiction as well. Um, and as soon as I started doing yoga, I, my addictions kind of fell away and I started to notice a lot of big improvements, but there was still, there was still more, you know, um, there was still more work that needed to be done, I think. And I, even though I was practicing yoga for a long time, the missing piece of the puzzle didn't come to me for quite a few years. And um, I was, I actually was even a yoga teacher at that point and been teaching for a number of years before I discovered that I was missing the breath part. So yoga is about like unifying body, mind and spirit. And the spirit part is basically your breath. Um, and yeah, that just hadn't connected with me. And as soon as I started to learn about breathing um, and started to plow through a lot of the misinformation that's out there, um, I just started to notice like huge improvements, not only in my mental health, but also in my physical well-being. Um, so that's how I kind of ended up um, writing the book. Wow, it sounds like an amazing journey. Incredible. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. Um, just to let everybody know as well, um, before we sort of get started with the questions, we're going to be doing a series of questions. Um, and I'm sure you all got lots and lots of questions as well that you'd like to ask. So please do feel free to um, drop them in the Q&A. Um, as I know, we are from all, all different places in the world right now. Um, I do ask that you do keep them in English if possible so that we can read them out um, as uh, I'm not overly multilingual myself at this time. Um, so if you can just let us know um, in English and then we can read them out um, either as we go on if they're sort of relating to kind of what we're doing. If not, we will uh, get to them at the end as well. So please do leave them in the Q&A if you have any questions or if you have any chat um, as we go along, please do let us know because this is an interactive uh, webinar as well and we want you to get the best out of it as well. So we're going to start with the first question. 
Um, we've already got um, some, we've actually already got some Q and A's already. People are keen, I love it. Um, and everyone, okay, great. So they're just confirming that we can hear everybody. That's perfect. Um, and um, there was an interesting question there, just as you sort of related to your um, sort of the addiction. Who, uh, someone has asked here, uh, let me see. Uh, Serena's just asked, which type of addiction uh, was it that you had? I had a feeling someone was gonna ask that. <laughs> Well, it's, it's the nitty gritty stuff, isn't it? That people want to people want to relate. It's the thing, stuff that people can relate to as well, really. Totally, yeah. I mean, I'll just say that um, when I when I started doing yoga, I the first thing that happened was like I just couldn't smoke anymore. Like I used to be a smoker, um, and within a month of starting yoga, I was just like I just couldn't smoke. Wow. And like I'd been smoking on and off uh, since I was 11. So that was kind of, yeah, I mean, that's disgraceful, isn't it? 11. <laughs> um, no judgments, no judgments. <laughs> but, uh, I, was, I thought I was such a rebel. <laughs> <laughs> but then, yeah, and then like I, I also stopped smoking weed, you know, um, it, it, yeah, it, it wasn't good for me, you know, yeah. smoking weed. And, uh, and I just started to see that when I started practicing yoga. And then after about two years, like I'm Irish, you know, it's a huge part of our culture drinking. Mm. Um, and yeah, after about two years, I just, uh, I just couldn't really relate to alcohol in the same way. I saw that I was using it as a crutch, you know, like a social crutch and I still drink, but it like, it's, I have a really healthy relationship with alcohol now. Yeah. Um, and there was there was some other things, but they kind of um, took longer to unravel. Like I'm also a workaholic. Uh, yoga didn't sort that out. So I, had to, <laughs> I had to do some like focused inquiry on that. But yeah, I mean, I, I would say I was like multi addicted. Wow. No, that's I think that's such an interesting standpoint as well, because, you know, when you're addicted as well and you've had those addictions, then you can really see that transformation and it helps people see that also. So I think that's a beautiful thing. Um, and I'm sure there's a lot of people that can relate with you on that as well, as we all live in this society where those things are apparent for a lot of us. So. So first question then that we've got here is most of us breathe without thinking about it, but according to your book, The Breathing Revolution, breathing does more than just keep us alive. Can you tell us why breathing is so important? So yeah, what most people don't understand about breathing is that it's, um, it's a process that's generated by the nervous system. So your nervous system is basically in your body. It's like, you know, if, if your body was a kingdom, uh, the nervous system is the monarchy. Yeah. So the nervous system kind of controls everything. And like a lot of people think the brain is sort of the, the main thing in the body, but the brain is actually part of the nervous system. So the nervous system is like incredibly complex and uh, it generates a lot of these vital processes. Like it makes your heart beat um, and it makes your food get digested and it makes you breathe. But the interesting thing about breathing is that Unlike your heart rate, you can't really control your heart rate, you know, just by thinking about it, but you can control how you breathe. Mm. So by changing how you breathe, you can actually have an impact on what's going on in your nervous system. And the main reason we want to do this is because the nervous system has two like major responses, stress and relaxation. Mm -hmm. And because of the society that we live in, and also like the fact that a lot of people have experienced trauma and their young lives I mean it's something like 25 percent of people have had traumatic childhoods mm -hmm. a lot of us are are in chronic states of stress and even mm -hmm. if you haven't experienced trauma like you know our culture is quite you know it's very driven and stress is just a part of life so a lot of us can get stuck in um, this sort of stressed part of the nervous system and that can then lead to illness like it's kind of widely known now that stress causes illness yeah, um, particularly, I mean, the most commonly accepted thing is that it causes like heart problems, you know, yeah. and hypertension and things like that. But there's actually evidence to show that it causes more diseases than that. Yeah. Um, so what can happen is that our nervous systems are basically out of whack. So certain breathing practices can actually bring you from a place of stress into bring your nervous system from that place of stress into more of a place of relaxation. And that's like where um your body kind of lets go it's like it helps your food digest so it's like it's kind of vital for overall health that you're breathing in the right way mm. a lot of the time even if um 
I mean, even if people are aware of their breathing, they can be breathing incorrectly yeah. and like actually generating more stress in their body because of incorrect, not incorrect, but undesirable, let's say, breathing habits. Wow. Um, so, and obviously that has a huge impact on your mental health as well, like whether mm -hmm. you're in that kind of stress state or, or more relaxed state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. And I think, oh gosh, uh, I totally agree with you in so many areas that, and you see with stress, I mean, how it affects so much of our bodies, you know, our skin and our, our, our energy levels and all sorts of things. I mean, it, it, I am a total believer of that it completely, um, if you are stressed in your life and you live in a stressed state, then you're not going to be in a healthy place. You're living in a very different um, state that you should be living in. But um, breathing, like you say, is a huge part of it because obviously you're, uh, that's the fuel that's going through you, isn't it? You know, that's the thing that's touching from the outside and the inside and it's uh, uh it's going all the way through so that's so interesting to hear um about that because it is so important and i think that just explained exactly how we needed it to explain so the second and, question sorry you go what were you saying? just to say um yeah they've actually defined anxiety depression ptsd uh various mental health conditions as stress related conditions wow this yeah. is actually, this is now confirmed it's been confirmed hasn't it yes. yeah. yeah amazing yeah and i think so many of us and i imagine so many people that are watching this right now will also agree that you can see where so many areas of their lives have, have experienced that and to know that breathing is how it got that direct response it's that thing that's going to allow you to basically not not have to live in that stress state and if you know how to do that and you know how to can be in control of that and have that awareness then you're already on top of the game so um you might not have to have as many trips to the doctors as you as you might think you have to so um, you can kind of deal with these things at home yourself so this is i imagine what <laughs> part of all of this is about for you in your book um so the second question we've got here for you is breath work is very popular at the moment and there are a lot of breathing resources out there what makes yours different because i agree there are so many so many different things out there i mean we hear all sorts of different ideas um what's kind of your unique selling point on this one <laughs> so <laughs> that focus on stress actually yeah. okay brilliant yeah uh, like uh yeah i i had like seri several um drafts of the book that I presented to my publisher in Bloomsbury and they kept like making suggestions and and eventually we just we realized that like the mental health aspect was was really what I was passionate about and so so yeah I think my book is the only one in the market that like specifically deals with breathing exercises for anxiety and depression and also like educates people about where these you know illnesses come from uh, because a lot of the time, you know, there's a lot of misinformation basically about what causes like anxiety and depression and anyone who's been depressed, I'm sure at one point has been told like, oh, it's all in your head mm -hmm. Same with anxiety, you know, but it's actually, this is like, this really helped me to understand it's not in my head, it's in my nervous system. So this is like a physiological problem, you yeah. know, depression, anxiety, they are physiological problems. And so they actually need a physiological solution. Um, and it's not just breathing, like obviously there's other things that we can do to help our mental health as well. Yeah. But breathing is like a really important part of that puzzle because it deals directly with the body. Yeah. Wow. Oh my goodness. Wow. That's, that's a lot because I think like it's getting what you said, it's a huge, massive part of, of, of kind of the, the dealing with stress. And that's really cool that you've got that position because I think, I mean, <laughs> I don't know that there's anyone that's got I'd love to know is it let us know if you've got a stress-free life and that you don't need this <laughs> I don't think it exists you know I think it's relative to everyone's um to everyone's life you know uh, so wow that's that's amazing and um so true for I think so many of us as well so that, that's really cool so stress is your is your is your uh, unique part of this and this is kind of where your angle is on this book which is wonderful um Okay, so third question. So like I said, everybody, if you are wanting to ask any questions at all, we have got a little question here that was in the chat. Um, it said, what kind of yoga do you do? I've heard about breathing techniques, which you can get sweat and um, you can get sweat and lose some pounds. So do you uh, do you know something about it? That's what that's what that says. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Okay, so like full disclosure. When I started changing how I breathed, what got me really interested was that I lost weight. 
Wow. Yeah. That's a big one. That's huge. I know, especially for like women in this terrible culture that we live, you know, like that was the thing that got me interested. Wow. Um, are you but, hearing this women <laughs> seriously and, and you know I was really interested in this and I did loads of research into it um but the the issue with talking and it's not in my book I don't talk about the weight loss aspect at all um because it, it hasn't been scientifically validated enough yeah. but there's loads of anecdotal evidence like loads of people who take up breathing practices and find that they just lose weight and I, I think it has to do with two things. I think it affects metabolism. Yeah. Mm. Uh, but I also think it reduces cortisol, which is the main stress hormone. So cortisol is a hormone that will actually make you retain fat, you know, particularly belly fat. Mm. So that's, you know, it, it, it hasn't, there hasn't been a study done on it that was conclusive. Um, but that's kind of my take on it. Wow. And I suppose that's something that, you know, you test and try these things, you become very aware and very attuned into your own body and what it's saying and what it's you're feeling. In. And I think, I suppose that's probably part of the breathing journey as well that you have is when you have that, you are all of a sudden um, awoken to, you understand more about your body because you're becoming a lot more aware of your body, aren't you? You know, your breathing it drives it's like the driver of everything it is like we were saying before <laughs> we came online you know we kind of can't exist without breathing breathing is is really um the thing that keeps us alive here so um i think that giving you that body awareness you're going to start understanding where those stress levels are at a lot quicker i think than because i think that's the another part of it as well with stress is that people are um not necessarily aware that they're actually stressed or because they're so used to running on a on a uh, like it's in a stress state that's very normal and, and natural for them because it's just been the way but then actually once you slow down it's those typical sort of people and say oh god when I stop like my whole everything just kind of goes whoa like this to me you know like there's that feeling um so uh, interestingly like I think when that happens people don't realize they're even living in that stress state am I right like do you do you want yeah, I mean that's why it takes when people go on holidays like it usually takes them like three days to sort of start to relax yeah we're just so used to living in this um wound up state yeah yeah and how did you find that because obviously you said that workaholic part of you still doesn't work like do you how do you operate in terms of your work life because you say you are a workaholic but you don't operate in a stress stressed place how does that work for you yeah I would say I'm not a workaholic anymore oh okay yeah yeah but it's like it, it you know that that also took some kind of like mental figuring out like yoga didn't make that go away yeah <laughs> uh, really like my um this is kind of off topic but you know things like boundaries yes um yeah and just like my need for validation through work like that's mm -hmm. what was driving a lot of that workaholism mm -hmm. um and then yeah and ju just making like self-care a priority basically because I, I can't really sustain uh you know workaholism without it like affecting my mental health quite profoundly and negatively mm -hmm. yes, so, yeah. which then in turn makes you stressed and then you have to go and do your breathing exercises again so <laughs> it's a full circle isn't it um, I'm just reading some more chats just come through here now. Um, so what have we got here? We are straight into Q and A session. Didn't miss the first part. Uh, don't worry. Um, we are we're doing bits and pieces. So if you've just joined, um, don't worry. With the Q and A, we're kind of running as we sort of go, but then also saving them for the end. So if you do have them, they are better in the Q and A because we can see them a lot more clearly. So please do pop them in there if you have them. Um, men are hearing it too as well. It's not just women. That's great to know that men are hearing it. <laughs> um, so what is the best technique? I hear from the tummy up and the nose instead mouth in and out and then how many breathing a minute average normal. Uh, so we'll get, I think one of the questions we've got in a bit is about sort of an exercise that you're gonna give us um, which we can probably go on to in a little bit. So we'll revisit that question for you. Um, so let's go on to the, the third question that we had there um, and see. So how did you discover the importance of breathing? So I know you've obviously touched on a little about that in your in your bio, but maybe just a little bit more of an expanse again. And also it'll probably be good for anyone that's just come online now just to hear that again. So, yeah, I've been I've been practicing yoga for six years. I think I've been teaching for two years and I taught like a very you know strong, vigorous class. And I used to practice very strong, vigorous classes as well, uh, like dynamic yoga, vinyasa yoga, ashtanga. Mm. um 
And yeah, but, and even though I had like experienced a lot of positive benefits from, from doing yoga, I, my mental health still, you know, it still got quite dark sometimes. So I had like a bit of a mystical experience. Um, and I, I write about this in the, in the intro to my book, but I went on a meditation retreat and I literally was like, you know, my intention was like, I need something to hold on to, you know, because life is so changeable and, um, and, you know, dramatic sometimes. Um, I just need something that like, is always gonna keep me safe, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and then like, I went into quite a deep meditation and I literally like heard this voice, you know, it was my voice, but you know, like that kind of deeper part of yourself speaking to me, mm -hmm. that the breath is the only thing that's real. And I just kept saying that like over and over again. And like with that, I just, I just, became really aware of my breathing in a way like I'd never had before yeah and and then suddenly like everything just went quiet you know like everything just became really really still and I just felt so connected to myself to you know the people around me to my body to the universe and um and I just I found like this moment of pure serenity wow. and um but I also kind of, I learned something in the experience, like my body remembered how to breathe properly. Mm. And so when I left the retreat, I, I knew how to breathe. You know, it was, it was different to like my habitual, uh, I had a terrible br breathing habits before. Um, and yeah, and then like within that week, you know, I just, I just noticed like, wow, I feel a lot more calm. You know, things, things feel different. And my yoga practice improved. Like it was much stronger. I had more balance. I was able to hold poses for longer. Um, and then like there was the weight loss, which, you know, isn't in the book because of science. Um, <laughs> but interestingly, it's a physical uh, rep representation. But again, it's always hard, isn't it, to connect those physicals to things like this? Because I believe like those things are only ever really allowed when, when you have that awareness yourself. And I think because, and then you can do it unless it's been, like I say, it's very hard for people because like you said, it's not been connected in terms of, it's not medical sort of research in that sense. And people find it hard to kind of believe that that's true. But I think that's where you have to have that, your own awareness mm -hmm. on that as well and understand that that's kind of that, for you, that was your experience, wasn't it? Yes, and that was what, because the other things I, I was just like, oh, that's nice. You know, I feel like really calm and like my yoga practice has improved and, but yeah, the weight loss was like, <laughs> really got me interested. Yeah, yeah. So that's where, yeah, yeah that, that's where my journey kind of began with it. Incredible, incredible. That's amazing. Thank you for that. Um, so we've got a couple more Q&As that have come through now. Um, so do you talk on di diaphragmic breathing in your book? Does it also impact the nervous system? So that's actually a big question because um, the term diaphragmatic breathing is um, it's a misnomer. So there's a, I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of misinformation out there about breathing. Mm. Um, and that term diaphragmatic breathing, respiratory physiotherapists don't like that term mm -hmm. actually. And like, so, and, and there's other breathing experts who don't like that term as well. Because the thing is you, you have to use your diaphragm when you're breathing, mm -hmm. you cannot breathe without using your diaphragm. So there's no such thing as diaphragmatic breathing. It's just breathing. Um, and I, when people are talking about diaphragmatic breathing, they often think of belly breathing as well. And, and belly breathing is actually the biggest mis, bit of misinformation in, in the breathing lexicon. Yeah. And like so many people perpetuate this, you know, like <laughs> there's other breathing experts. Yeah, it's, it's terrible. So um, because it's... Uh, the term belly breathing, it doesn't really tell you how to breathe, you, you know, and a lot of the time when you say belly breathing, people just end up like inflating their stomachs, you know, mm. um, whereas what you want to be doing is, is breathing through the lower ribs, which is where your diaphragm is. So, um, and people have this dryness, as you say. It. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So people have this thing as well, the chest breathing is bad. And, and to be more precise, mm -hmm. it's not chest breathing that's bad. It's like high chest breathing because your diaphragm is actually in your chest, you know, mm. there at the bottom of your ribs, like the bottom of your ribs houses your diaphragm. So when you breathe in, your diaphragm moves down 
And it's that downward movement that creates a bulge in your belly. So that's why people think belly breathing, you know, and diaphragmatic breathing, but that happens anyway. Your diaphragm moves downwards, whether you're trying to belly breathe or not. It's just that some people, the movement is more restricted um, due to various factors like stress or old age or whatever, but not everyone has the same amount of diaphragmatic movement. Um, but focusing on your belly isn't gonna make your diaphragm move anymore. You, you need to focus on the actual diaphragm, but it's difficult because you can't actually feel your diaphragm. There's no sensory nerves in the diaphragm. So you can only really do it by being quite aware of where the diaphragm is. Yeah. And then just being very aware of like diaphragm moves down when I inhale. And then when I exhale, diaphragm moves upwards. So when your diaphragm moves upwards, the belly then kind of like goes in and the air moves out of the lungs. Um, so, but it's, uh, there's more to it than that as well, because it's really important when you're doing, when you're focusing on your diaphragm, that the rest of your body is relaxed. So this is a mistake a lot of people will make as well. And I think this is where a lot of other breathing experts get things wrong is they don't focus enough on uh, somatic awareness before taking people through breathing exercises. So, and I mean, I made this mistake as well. Like in my first few years as a yoga teacher, I would tell people to breathe, but like people can often end up hyperventilating when they're trying to breathe correctly. So it's really important that like people aren't clenching their jaws, that they're not clenching their necks, that their shoulders are relaxed. And uh, ideally, you know, breathing exercises, I believe should be done originally lying down because when you're lying down, your body is, is, has a tendency to more relax and your posture is also better. Um, so yeah, it's, it's quite a complicated uh, subject for, such, for something that's sort of so innate, but I think years of like learned behavior, yeah. you know, bad posture, emotional holding as well, like holding in your emotions affects your breath. Mm -hmm. um, they found that like when people are trying to repress a feeling, they'll actually hold their breath. Um, there is a thing called, I always uh, share this little um, bit of information because I think it's fascinating, but there's a term called email apnea. Apnea means not breathing, uh, no breath. Um, and it was found that like when people are sending emails, they will hold their breath between finishing the email and pressing send. No, and no, just, oh my gosh. Breath that they have, like, you know, or like, and I told that to someone before and he's like, oh yeah, I did that when I'm about to ask a girl out, you know? Oh my gosh. And now you'll be like, and this is the thing, now we've said it, now you've mentioned this, like everybody that's watching, you're going to try that now, you're going to notice whenever you send an email, you go, yeah. you're going to have that moment we hold our breath repeatedly during the day like and it's always during moments of emotional stress yes, yes. Um, because holding your breath makes your blood pressure rise so you become more focused um but it also it also kind of has this um uplifting effect mm -hmm. you know so it can enable us to repress our feelings mm -hmm. So um, there's like specific kinds of breath work, actually, like holotropic breath work or rebirthing and stuff where they actually use specific breathing techniques to try and release all that repressed emotion. So that's not what my book is about, but like that's that's just to give you an indication of like how complex our breathing patterns are. And the result of they're the result of many different things, you know, physical, emotional and mental Wow, that's amazing. And you, and I love that, you know, just going through that as well. And I don't know if anyone else was doing it at home, but we, I, as you were doing that, I was breathing and, and it's such a big difference, especially when you focus, when you're focusing just below the ribs to belly, like it's actually a completely different feeling when you're trying to, because you're actively trying to push your belly out and it's a very different feeling. So that was that was some a, a key bit of information that I think is going to help a lot of people now after that. So that was wonderful. A lot of my because I did a bunch of um, I can't exactly call them case studies because they weren't really you know you have to have a certain number of parameters to call things case studies. But I did trials for the breathing exercise mm. before um, I released the book and uh, to to find out which exercises worked and whatnot and. Um, and that chapter where I where I teach people about the movement of the diaphragm, the exercise associated with that, a lot of people said they noticed their digestion improved oh, yeah. when they actually learned about the movement of the diaphragm. 
And that's because when the diaphragm moves freely, and like I said, some people, the movement is more restricted. So you can actually learn to like have a little bit more movement with the diaphragm. But when it moves freely, it like it massages the internal organs, you know, and it actually your digestive system is up here as well. Um, so, yeah, like there was one one of my um, participants had IBS and he had a tendency to uh, towards constipation. And he said that it was like the effect was almost immediate. Wow amazing that is absolutely amazing wow because I, I a thought was just coming to my mind there I think sometimes and and maybe a lot of people can relate to this as well but you know when you feel like you're trying to hold your stomach in as well because you're trying to like suck it up you know like pull it all in and amazing you're trying to do it to think you look you know to try and look the certain way that you're trying to look but actually the amazing thing is is that you're <laughs> reversing that effect because you're like you say you're clenching and you're not allowing it to breathe out so when you're feeling it if you're feeling bloated or whatever the advice is to just let it hang <laughs> and let it breathe through you know amazing wow so we'll just do another question from from our um from these questions here and then we'll go back on to another one from um, the Q&A. So we've got, how does breathing affect our mental health? Now, we've kind of touched on this already, haven't we? Is there anything else to sort of expand on that one? Apart from the obvious? Uh, I mean, so I, I was talking about um, how the nervous system has these two responses, you know, stress and relaxation. Mm. Um, and yeah, basically, if you're, if you're more, uh, if your nervous system is I'm trying to like talk about it in really simple terms, but if your nervous system is more orientated towards stress, that has like physical, mental and emotional consequences. Um, and, and one of those is anxiety. You know, if, you, if you're more stressed, you're gonna be more anxious. Um, there is a, I mean, I, I'm sure most people have heard of like the fight flight response. Mm, that's yeah. what your nervous system like stress is normal you know like the stress is just the, the counterbalance to um relaxation i think of it more as stimulation the nervous system vacillates between stimulation and relaxation um but when stress is chronic or acute like if you if you experience a trauma that would be acute stress mm. um then the nervous system tends to pivot more uh from stimulation more into stress and then you start to get like these, um, yeah, you start to get all these negative effects. And one of those is anxiety. There's um, depression is more complicated. Mm -hmm. um, like anxiety is quite straightforward. It's widely accepted that, that anxiety is related to the fight flight response. But depression is, um, I guess I can talk from my experience. Like I didn't know that I had anxiety um, for most of my life because my depression was so intense. And what I understand now about depression is depression is holding. So depression is repression. So I think depression has a lot to do with like breath holding actually. So like not breathing properly, mm -hmm. um, because I wasn't so much of a hyperventilator. Uh, I, I wouldn't breathe enough actually. And I, I would like hold my breath a lot and I didn't realize I was doing that, you know, um, and then, yeah, I mean, once I started to breathe properly and like more freely, I, it, there was actually like a massive catharsis. So like all this sort of repressed grief that I, I'd been carrying started to come out, you know, and like once, once that kind of, and, and that was like over the course of a year, you know, there was like a lot of, a lot of grief coming out. And it was only after that, that I was like, oh my God, I'm anxious as well. <laughs> depression was my only issue, but the anxiety was under the depression. Oh, wow. um, so yeah, I think, I think depression is more complex, but anxiety is, is fairly widely accepted that it's related to the fight flight response. Wow, gosh, so much of this is like, it's just peeling off those layers, isn't it? And, and finding all that underneath is, wow, there's so much to it. Um, okay, we've got another Q and A here uh, from Awesome Mac. How do you differentiate, sorry, from unconscious breathing, like how we do every day, and conscious focusing on breathing? Sometimes I feel yoga and breathing and all seems very spiritual to run away from reality of life. When you finish that exercise, you are back to normal. How do you make it long lasting and not like a short term gap to address your monsters? That's a great question. Yeah. Um... Yeah, because 
people can also end up using things like yoga and breath work and meditation to run away from their demons as well. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like there's a there's an expression uh, called beginner's mind. Um, you know, it's used in like Zen Buddhism and lots of different practices. And it's yeah. about how like people who are new to a practice um, sometimes get like much better benefits than than people who've been doing it for a long time. And it's because they come with like an open mind. Mm -hmm. Whereas sometimes if you learn a lot about a subject, you can end up like um, you know how you know how to do it um, in a practical sense, but you're not actually present. You know, you're not you're not really there. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you can even do these like breathing practices unconsciously. Mm. Or because you just want you, once you get to the point of like a certain level of knowledge you can kind of end up switching off sometimes mm. Mm. So I would say that's the difference for me between like conscious and unconscious it's like how present you are because I mean there's a balance in um in this sort of field of study between doing breathing exercises and between letting the breath breathe you mm. that's the expression that we use yeah. you know? yeah sometimes sometimes like you just need to take a step back and just notice how you're breathing and that's actually really hard because usually as soon as you bring your attention to your breath it changes mm. so that's actually one of the hardest things to do so it's really just um it's really just your level for me it's it's your level of awareness and presence so you can be breathing consciously sitting at your desk mm. you know like working and just like noticing your breathing uh, and you can breathe unconsciously in a yoga class mm. you know, or like, you know, doing holotropic breath work or something. It's it's really down to you. Because it's interesting, I think, as well, when people, the, there's the other side of that is when you become conscious of your breathing. And I imagine some people have had this as well, is where you, you kind of almost have, you can always then have a panic attack almost about it because you're thinking so much about it and it becomes almost a mental thing, doesn't it? Where, where you've gone straight up into your mind about it and then all of a sudden you're struggling to breathe like that's that's mm -hmm. the other side I, I speak from my own experience I used to have that when I was younger and obviously what I realized it was always things that you understood that were behind all of that like why why are you panicking about that and, and then you go into the why of all of that and that kind of comes out but still that thought process of I remember I used to feel like I'd get to this point and I would go I can't I can't get over the point and it was just this um that feeling so uh, I suppose that question as well is on the on the bigger scale of things is kind of how to integrate it is really the question is it how to integrate it into a day everyday life without obviously if we couldn't be conscious of it uh, of, of every single breath that we took otherwise <laughs> we would be we'd just sit there breathing all day and, and nothing else really yeah I think how to integrate it into daily life I feel like I, I've gone through phases where I'm much more aware of my breath uh, mm. particularly when I was writing the book but for me it's like a key moment it's like now I, I find I just never cross that threshold of stress mm. without coming back to my breathing so I have breathing techniques that like when I'm really stressed I can I can use and they'll calm me down okay um, whereas before I just like didn't have that so yeah well, I don't think the goal is to be you know monitoring our breathing you know every minute of the day no like it's it's definitely to notice when we have strong emotional responses to things mm. how to like be more present with that uh that also like helps us get to know ourselves better because ultimately like this I don't see this as a like as a as a breathing's not a fix you know it's not like a quick fix it's part of a journey that that then leads to like um a lot of solutions yeah yeah no I think that's beautiful because I think that's I think generally when people are searching for that uh reason as to why they are like looking for that quick fix okay great that works now I can move on and, and I mean I don't know from my own experiences as well it's, it's never been the case because you go to that next level of okay it's this and then you're no 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 it's this <laughs> You keep going on the dive, you dive deeper and deeper and deeper further in and then you find what it is. So no, that's, that was a really good question though. Thank you for that question. Um, so we'll go back to ours quickly, which were, um, why are people disconnected from themselves and um, from themselves and their bodies? This is a good one. Why would you say? Um, 
Yeah, I think I think a lot of it has to do. I sort of I'm hesitating because I kind of uh, answered this a little bit in other questions, but um, yeah, I think we live in a very intellectual culture. Um, That's a great know, way of putting it. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like I'm actually. This sounds weird, but I'm actually anti-intellectual. Yeah. I'm not anti-intelligence. Anti no. Um, but I'm anti-intellectualism. Uh, there's a brilliant TED talk actually, which probably most people have seen. It's like um, about education, uh, and and the guy I can't remember his name now. I'm a terrible memory, but um, the guy in it basically talks about how like the education system, like from the time we go to school, it stops educating us about our body and just like educates us like further and further above the neck until finally mm -hmm. it's just like educating one little small part of our brain. Wow. The whole education system is basically designed to create college professors, you know. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, that aside, like we live in a very intellectual culture and a lot of people don't realize that the body has an intelligence, you know, and I think, I think some of this comes from like um, religious repression where the body was seen as like something that was impure and sinful and dirty. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I think our body is much more intelligent than our mind. Actually, mm. our mind is just like a small fraction of our overall intelligence. Um, but that focus on the intellect uh, divorces us from the intelligence of our bodies and that divorces us from our bodies in general so like a lot of people when they go to yoga at first they're unless they're like an athlete or something or a gym a gymnast or a dancer actually um they're just like they can't believe how bad what a bad state their body is in and that was like my experience the first time I did yoga I was 24 and I was like I can't even touch my toes like what the hell you know I mean I was shaking and I was like I'm a young person like what is going on yeah um, but I was just so disconnected I was very intellectual like I was very in my head and um and and yeah and also when you're in your head it's a way of divorcing yourself from your emotions and and I think that's another problem because like life is hard you know and like we've all experienced pain and suffering but again, like culturally, and I think men suffer even more from this than women, but women do suffer from this as well, is like we're taught to repress our emotions. Yeah, yeah. And men particularly are taught like, you know, you're not allowed to cry. And women are taught like, you're not allowed to get angry. You know, like that's mm -hmm. not ladylike or, so we're very emotionally repressed as people. And like, it's not our fault, you know, it's cultural and it goes back generations. And um, so emotionally repressed, physically disconnected, you know. <laughs> but there is hope yeah there is hope for sure and like you said with breath you will come back into your body we will, you will retreat back in um oh. absolutely absolutely we've got one in the chat here that says hello what exercise would you recommend to heavily uh, active the clear opening of the third eye and stimulate the penile gland that's very specific but um is there i'm thinking i was gonna say do you want to um is there an exercise that you would like to kind of share with everyone um to sort of take away is there anything that you could could share yes i can um i'll just answer that question first yeah. i wouldn't recommend trying to open your third eye um i yeah I, unless you've been like practicing yoga for a very long time um because most people in the west like their issue isn't really up here it's that they're not grounded enough mm. um so yeah and I just know a lot of people who who try and uh they try and develop like psychic powers or whatever but all of that is pointless unless you're actually connected to your body and to yourself mm. uh, because it won't actually be real so you know there's an expression like the the deeper your roots go the higher your branches grow um so yeah the most important and the hardest thing is actually to ground um it's it's fairly easy to to work with all this kind of stuff um so yeah and that is something i feel quite strongly about because i made that mistake <laughs> wow no that's really really strong and i've, I've actually kind of not heard it in that sense because i think we're always taught to kind of go to the higher self go to kind of where that is um but i i'm totally with you on that it's almost like you can't you can't operate what's going on up there if you can't operate what's going on down here so that makes total sense and i think it's also like a byproduct of our intellectual culture 
you know, but it's all, it's still all very up here, you know, mm. whereas we also have a lot of um, issues like with, with love, mm. you know, we don't really understand love and this is probably a, a global thing, like, um, you know, we, we confuse love with codependency, um, we don't know how to love with boundaries, you know, yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, and that's something that we could easily work on as well. But grounding is the start. Yeah, I love that answer. Absolutely love that answer. So is there an exercise or anything that anyone can, that we can sort of take away um, from it? Anyone that can practice this at home? I know we did sort of that little, the diaphragm one, which actually was fantastic, but is there anything else? Yeah, it's, it's really, really simple. Basically, um, when you're stressed, you just lengthen your exhale. Like it's, it's literally that easy. Mm. Um, and if you're like highly stressed, you exhale through the mouth. So that's, um, if you've had panic attacks before, like that's probably, mm. you learn like that, that's how you get yourself out of a panic attack is just. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And you just let, I mean, I breathe like this on the tube quite a lot because I find the tube like super stressful. <laughs> Especially when it's crowded, you know, and I'm like, yeah. Sometimes I see people look at me because I'm just sitting there. <laughs> I love it. Oh. like it calms me down you know yeah. or like if I can't sleep sometimes like that's what I'll do you know just like lengthen my exhale or like breathe out through the mouth that's great that's a really good one there was one um that they teach sort of in schools I think as well like I think it's and it's to do with almost the exhale isn't it again where you know when a child's getting all fret up or whatever they tell them to blow out the birthday candle ah. and um so I do this with my um my nephew and he and instantly because it, it takes their mind oh birthday candle and then they're but it's the breathing out so when you said that I thought it must be the breathing out then that yes that allows them to come back it is because when you focus on your exhale um it also lengthens your inhale oh. so yeah the problem with like hyperventilation is that people are inhaling and exhaling really quickly so yeah. the inhale is short and the exhale is short but because they're not getting enough breath they'll, they'll keep trying to take in more breath by inhaling but the problem is with the exhale, you know, so once you, once you look at the, ex, once you take care of the exhale, the inhale takes care of itself. Wow. That's big. And I think I generally, I think because mind wise, that's what you think of. You think I need more breath. I need more, you need to get it in, but actually you've got to get it out. That's, that's the main thing. And just to bring it in with what I was talking about earlier with stress and relaxation, lengthening your exhale activates that relaxation part of your nervous system, basically it slows down your heart rate mm. and then it brings your parasympathetic system online. Um, so just lengthening your exhale will start to shift your nervous system from stress into relaxation. Okay, amazing. That's a great tip. That is a really, really good tip. Okay, we'll have a look again at the Q&A. Um, what's your opinion of, just excuse me if I can't pronounce this correctly, but it's um, Buteyoko method. Is that how you say it? What's your opinion of Buteyoko method? <laughs> uh, Buteyoko. But, oh gosh, that was terrible. <laughs> take, okay, I still struggle to pronounce it. I've had many people correct. Okay, no, but take, <laughs> okay, lovely. What what's your what's your opinion about it? Um, I I did actually include it in my book in an earlier draft, and I was told to take it out because um, oh, sorry, that sounds uh, very autocratic, but it was suggested that I take it out because um, it hasn't been like scientifically validated okay. um a lot of the studies are sort of quite old now i'm not saying that it doesn't work um that's just why it, it doesn't feature in my book and i do mention it briefly um just but, for those that don't sort of know what it is what just generally what is what is it so uh buketo breathing is um i oh god i hope i'm pronouncing it right <laughs> it's uh it's breathing techniques that focus on breath holding, but it, it a lot of it has to do, the theory is sort of carbon dioxide um, intolerance. So they believe that people are intolerant to carbon dioxide and that leads to hyperventilation. And I mean, it's I can't really explain it all um, mm. in, a, in a couple of seconds, but um, yeah, I mean, I, as part of the research for my book, I did a free diving course Oh, interesting um, which is like you know diving without oxygen yeah. um I was terrible at it you know because <laughs> if you have anxiety it's actually very hard to hold your breath yeah um but part of their whole philosophy about breath holding is that if you get yourself into a relaxed state of mind you can hold your breath for longer 
Um, so they actually use a lot of the um, Bucato uh, exercises, you know, a lot of Bucato exercises are about breath holding. Mm -hmm. um, so I definitely think there's something in it. It's not where my expertise are because I'm more focused on mental health. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of good theories out there and they all have pros and cons basically. And um, I would just think about like what uh, people want to get out of this for themselves, you know? Okay. No, that's great. No, I, that's, uh, and again, another interesting exercise. I imagine that you had to, to go and do free diving as well. Like, Oh my gosh. And I've seen some of those people can hold it for like almost 10 minutes or something. It's insane. yeah. The world record is like 17 minutes. I think. Oh my goodness me. <laughs> breath for 17 minutes. I'm wow. actually diving down to a, a deep depth as well. That's yeah. incredible, isn't it? The human body is incredible. Um, okay, another one of our questions. You say in your book that many people don't breathe properly. Can you explain some of the mistakes that we make? Is there anything that, uh, we may have touched on a couple of things there, but is there anything else in that that you think that we might be, generally we'll be making mistakes from? Yeah, so I talked a little bit about like the belly breathing um, yeah. and uh, the diaphragmatic breathing. Um, and like a really obvious one is chest breathing. Um, so, but that's also, um, not a very accurate term. So the, the issue is a lot of people breathe up high in the chest. It's also called like clavicle breathing. Um, and so just using like the upper part of the lungs and like, that's actually quite stressful for the body. You've got like your main breathing muscles, which are your diaphragm and your intercostals, which are like little muscles going through your ribs. Um, but there's loads of other muscles that can be used to help you breathe. And like, you can actually even use like muscles in your neck to help you breathe. Wow. So, so high chest breathing or clavicle breathing is basically where you're using all these tiny muscles. Like you can even use muscles in the face. I know that sounds bizarre, but um, because it's all, the, the whole body is connected and they're basically using like muscles in the neck and all this to try and lift the rib cage so that they can breathe properly. So that's obviously like not ideal, you know, it's like way more effort for the body. It's, it's way more tiring and it puts the body into a state of stress to breathe like that. Um, so that's like, that's a huge mistake that people make, but I would say equally commonly is like the, the low belly breathing, which is, um, which can lead to like lethargy. So um, low energy uh, kind of sluggishness and breathing high up can like make people more anxious um, and then, yeah, like a big mistake people make is, um, mouth breathing as well. Um, so nose breathing is sort of the most important aspect of breathing that you can change. In my book, I like go through the five main aspects of breathing. Um, so those are things that you can change about your breath that are either beneficial or harmful to you. So nose breathing is like the most important thing is that you breathe in and out through the nose. And um, a lot of people will, will mouth breathe during like low level activities. So like watching TV or, you know, just taking like a gentle walk. And why um, is that? Why, why do people generally just do it through their mouth? Uh, well, sometimes it can be due to like respiratory problems. Sometimes mm. it's like a bad habit. Mm. You know, but, um, but yeah, mouth breathing is, is related to the fight or flight response. When we breathe in and out through the mouth, it actually triggers the fight flight response. So breathing in and out through the mouth is actually more stressful than for your nervous system than nose breathing. Wow, this is so interesting. Gosh, that's amazing. Wow. And someone's just put here, I noticed that less toxins in the body provide a better breath holding time. Most free free diver oh, are low in toxins. So this is about the free diving. Could you recommend a good diet supporting breath work? Ooh, well, I don't know because I, I don't know how to measure toxins in the blood really. Um, I, uh, yeah, I don't know how that could be measured. Um, I don't know. I think diet is, I have a lot of views on diet. I've tried every diet under the sun. <laughs> um, and yeah, I think, it, I think it can be quite individual. And also, I mean, there's, there's research saying that everything is good for you and everything is bad for you. Mm. And also there's, there's research saying that meat is bad for you. There's research saying meat is good for you. Um, same about soy, you know. So 
yeah, I, I have found a diet that works for me, which is like no refined foods, basically like no junk food. Um, I eat dark chocolate. Um, and, but I do eat meat, you know, I don't do dairy. I found dairy, like, uh, dairy really like, like lowered my energy levels. Mm. Um, but this is like after years of experimentation and trial and error. And like, I was a vegan a long time ago, you know, I was a vegetarian for a long time. I don't think those, I know veganism is really popular right now. It didn't work for me. It didn't make me healthier. It didn't make me feel good. And I did it for ages, you know, so yeah, I think diet's very, um, very individual. Do you think it's linked between breath then at all? Is there anything, any correlation between it? Yeah, I mean, like I notice it on the rare occasion when I have a hangover, like I notice that my breath is definitely affected. Okay. Um, so like obviously alcohol is yeah. like really bad for us. Hmm. Um, <laughs> no surprises there. <laughs> this, sounds, no, this sounds really weird, but like I only drink spirits hmm. when I do drink, I because there's less toxins in it, you know. So um, wine, beer, cider, full of toxins, you know, unless you're drinking like organic wine. Hmm. So I just noticed when I drank like I'm Irish, so I like whiskey. Uh, when I drink whiskey or gin or vodka or something you know I'll have like two drinks and I don't have any negative effects whereas if I had two glasses of wine my body is quite clean now yeah two glasses of wine I would actually have a hangover the next day um so yeah don't drink I suppose that's all (laughs) or drink less drink spirits (laughs) and I think like you said diet is one of those things there's so many components to it as well for every individual it's very hard to almost kind of like do it give it to one thing but I suppose sharing your experience is always going to give people that like reflection on themselves and they'll be able to have a look into that anyway um, so we've got a, sorry go on people really need to um like do research but also experiment and don't just do things because other people say that um they should or that it works for them or because what works for one person might not work for you and and I can't believe I'm saying this but like that's actually a controversial concept like this idea of like uh, that we're individuals and we're uniquely formulated. Like some people can't really accept that. They think that we should all be doing the same thing, but I, I don't, I don't believe so. No, I'm with you on that one as well. I believe that also that people, they do, they, because we, we're all, there's so many similarities to that, but there's so much uniqueness in every single person. I totally believe that with you. Um, so I just want to make sure, so it just lasting, um, we're just sort of starting to wrap up now. So if anyone has got any questions, just quickly let us know, because I want to make sure I've got your questions in. Uh, we've got this other, we've got another one from Serene. What are the key components of proper breathing? Um, so I go into it in like a lot of detail in my book. Um, uh, the, in a nutshell, I would say understanding tension in your body. So understanding where you're holding tension is really, really important. Um, because otherwise you won't, you know, you can end up breathing in a more stressed way. Um, or you won't be able to take a full breath, uh, breathing through your nose um learning how to uh what part of the body you should your breath should be uh filling basically so your breath should be um moving through the the low chest high belly learning how to breathe there um then learning how to lengthen your exhale really important uh particularly for mental health um and breathing in sort of like a rhythmic way so like not breath holding randomly during the day like that takes a lot of monitoring and um, awareness um but yeah I think those are like the main points I think I've forgotten something but (laughs) (laughs) no no they sound I mean that sounded like you covered everything to be fair um We've got where David is also saying in Austria kids need to wear masks during the sports these days Wow, sometimes even for two hours, which makes them sometimes dizzy. Is there any exercise the kids could do after to rebalance? That's quite a a good question. Is there anything they could do? Yeah, I like, I feel your pain. I mean, I struggle even just wearing a mask on the tube, you know, Mm -hmm. on the underground. Um, Yeah, I would say, I mean, if they're getting dizzy, that means that they're hyperventilating. 
Mm. Um, so shadow breathing. Um, so yeah, a, a really nice exercise actually, if um, when your kid comes home or like finishes sport, if you get them to sit on a chair and just place your hands on their shoulders and just apply very gentle pressure and then just like ask them to breathe slowly. Putting your hands on their shoulders will actually like force them to breathe through their lower their lower chest. Because um, as I said earlier, with um, hyperventilation, you're breathing high up in the body. Mm, mm. Applying that pressure to their shoulders will actually encourage the breath to drop in the body. Yeah. Because this is all quite conceptual for children, you know, like yeah. techniques and stuff, but just some gentle physical pressure on the shoulders um, will probably help them and just encourage them to breathe slowly and, and maybe to exhale through the mouth as well. Oh, that's great. Yeah, that's great. I think you definitely answered that question. Um, gosh, that's that's quite something. So I feel like we've got through all of the questions that we've got so far and we are featuring, reaching the end. So just letting everybody know, um, David says, thank you. We appreciate your answers and time. So you're welcome, David. Um, just letting everybody know, obviously, if you are wanting to uh, have a look and, and know more about the book, Yolanda's information is all on the event page, um, her website and the link to her book as well is all there. Is there anything there to add from you, Yolanda of that no no good was there anything that you feel like um was definitely we, we wanted to cover anything more um in this that was you thought was a, a good point or do you feel like I feel like we kind of went through everything or was there anything for you I mean it's such a huge topic loads <laughs> <laughs> more we could have talked about yeah 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 <laughs> And I think, I think, I mean, the only sort of thing that I kind of um, came up with is about the rhythm of breath. I think um, uh, obviously that can, can differ. Is there anything um, that we could go into with that at all or? Um, so, so the rhythm of your breath affects something called heart rate variability, which mm -hmm. some people might know that's like, um, that's now a really like, uh, it's, it's a very um, new diagnosis. Sorry, I just hesitated there because I saw my friend posting. Oh! <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's a new kind of... In the past, um, doctors would like take your heart rate, you know, and they'd use that as like a measure of health. Whereas a new way of measuring health is uh, heart rate variability, which is basically like the rhythm of your heartbeat. And uh, they've been using this as a diagnostic tool for thousands of years in the east you know like in uh, Chinese medicine they'll they'll take your pulse um, but they're not just counting how fast your heart is is beating they're actually looking at the quality of your heart rate so the rhythm of your heart rate and also like you know how how strong it is how weak it is um, but the rhythm of your breath in a nutshell um, affects your heart rate variability because your heart rate variability is the rhythm of your heart Mm. And when you change the rhythm of your breath, it actually changes the rhythm of your heartbeat. Um, so what you want is a, is a rhythm in your heartbeat that has high variability. So not low, low variability is just like doof, 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 where there's not a lot of change. The rhythm is quite static. Mm. Um, and you don't want too much variability either. So you want like the right amount. So yeah, there's certain breathing exercises you can do that are rhythmic that will actually like influence your heart rate variability. Mm -hmm. um, and low heart rate variability is associated with depression. Like people who are depressed have low heart rate variability often. Um, people with uh, anxiety, often their heart rate variability is too high or people with PTSD. Um, but then, yeah, they've also found that like people with cancer ha have low heart rate variability. So it's very connected to mental and physical health. Wow. I mean, just from a couple of those examples, it really just show that it is completely connected, isn't it? That's that's mind blowing. Wow. OK, wonderful. Um, so like we said, um, I, I imagine those sorts of all those topics that we sort of spoke about, I imagine that's all in your book as well. Um, so everyone can go and grab that at the link as well. So we've had um, some lovely and lots of people come on tonight as well. So thank you so much, Yolanda. That was so informative as well. And uh, I've definitely taken some takeaways myself um, tonight as well. So thank you so much. Okay. And um, yeah we're going to sign off now so thank you everyone for joining and uh, we'll hope to see you at another another webinar and um like i said if you need anything all the links are on the event page that's where you can get all of yolanda's stuff okay amazing well, thank you so much
feel free to connect with me on Instagram as well. If any of you end up reading the book and you want to like reach out, just let me know that you're at this event and say hi. Yeah. Amazing. Okay. Perfect. And I suppose that's all on your website. Is it all of those, all of that information as well? Uh, my Instagram, I don't think is on my website. I'm oh. terrible at social media, but I will reply to you if you write to me. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. Cool. Amazing. All right then. Lovely. Well, we'll, we'll sort of wrap this up now and um, we'll, we'll leave it there. Perfect. Thank you so much. And uh, have a lovely rest of your evening. <laughs> Bye. Bye Thanks. everyone. Bye.